Hi, and welcome today to today's webinar. Um, again, just so delighted to have so many people from uh, CIFST participating in the webinar series. My name is Dr. Amy Prue, and I'm Professor and Academic Program Coordinator at the Canadian Food and Wine Institute at Niagara College. And I'm also your brand new president for the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology. And I am very grateful for the confidence that you've shown me through our most recent AGM in that election period. On behalf of Food in Canada, Canada's only national food and beverage processing magazine and CIFST, welcome to our 2021 Table Talks webinar series, The Learning Trough, where we bring you regular webinars that explore the future of food. If you haven't already, please visit CIFST's website for the list of some of our upcoming webinars, which will continue every second week until June, and then we'll revisit them again in September and through November. If you are a member of CIFST, Registration for the entire webinar series is free. I'd like to thank Dempsey Food for their generous sponsorship of the uh, webinar series. And we'd also like to thank Acadian Sea Plants as today's webinar sponsor. Today's topic is going to be on adaptation and rapid response in food processing from pivoting to committing. But uh, to be quite frank, Sylvain and I had some great conversations starting off and we, we really just wanted to uh, have a really robust conversation and Sylvain and I have had fireside chats numerous times. Sylvain Charlevoix is Professor, Director of um, the Agri-Food Analytics Lab and former Dean of the Faculty of Management at Dalhousie University. He's uh, by uh, far one of Canada's most foremost voices in food and he's been continuously generous with CIFST to share his his expertise and his wisdom, and also to be an encouraging mentor to so many of us. Um, I know that in my own career, Sylvain has been encouraging and uh, helping me diversify my own perspectives on food in that I, I trained as a chemist, but understanding the business of food is really, really essential. Now, um, we, with the new webinar series that we started in January, we, we, we thought we'd get a little bit of some fun Q&A because uh, I, I don't think there's very few people who haven't seen Sylvain on the television or in the news, but we'd like to get a little bit more sense of who are some of these food leaders, some of these thought leaders that we should be knowing about and aspiring to be a little bit more like. Um, so we are, we're we're doing a little bit of Q&A just for fun. Um, I know Sylvain at the, at the Agri-Food Analytics Lab did, a, did a, a research study on home behaviors in food, and I'm curious. Right. During during COVID and the the lockdown, did you take up baking or cooking at home, Sylvain? And if so, what uh, did you cook? I, I know baking was a big deal in many people's homes. Uh, the, the truth is, that baking was a big deal in our homes for 20 years at least. Uh, we actually we were making our own bread for for quite some time, and uh, and the reason is because it's it's a, it's natural, and so we appreciated. Uh, baking for already before COVID, so we were well prepared for COVID <laughs> as a as a as a family for sure. Going down my list of questions here, I uh, did you discover something on TV or a book that you would recommend to many of our uh, many of the members of CIFST or students that you would recommend to them that uh, would help them give some insight or help them relax. That's a that's a good question. Uh, you know, for over the last eleven months, we've been talking about um, you know, uncertainty, how the virus has uh, disrupted everything, uh, and the need for more science to understand uh, what is going on, how to manage risks, whether it's in public health or in food. And uh, the one book that basically came up in my mind was a book that I actually read early on in my academic career. It's called The Risk Society by Ulrich Beck, which is a classic. Uh, and if you haven't read that book, uh, I encourage you to read it. Have you ever read that book, uh, Amy? I have. And uh, I, I actually years ago taught a course in food systems risk management in the graduate program at Ryerson. And I had that book and another book by Peter Sandman, um, Understanding oh, yeah. Risk and Outrage. And yeah. we use those books to really understand as food industry leaders, how do we communicate risk? How do we evaluate risk? How do we 
go about discussing it within our organizations and also from an outward facing perspective how do you communicate it to the public because food is not there, there's no risk free food but we can do a lot internally to manage that risk and we can do a lot externally to help consumers understand and mitigate within that and yeah, no, absolutely um, and uh as as food scientists we we have to of course our focus is is about understanding risks uh, but also how you convey that risk knowing that science is not an absolute so what is true today may not be true tomorrow and so how do you make sure people understand that dynamic that that scientific dynamic is is critical especially in an era where viruses are real uh we're talking about variants this is not this is not going to go away anytime soon we, we're going to have to befriend viruses unfortunately and uh, as scientists we have to help our communities actually better understand these risks uh, as quickly as possible and 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 appreciate them as well uh, whether it's in food or public health it doesn't matter but it, it it's i think that understanding understanding what science does uh, was was a bit lacking for a while and i know there was a lot of criticism around masks to use masks not to use masks how uh, I was speaking this morning with the president of Restaurants Canada. Uh, he's concerned about obviously his sector uh, because he felt that the science wasn't really listened to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, opening restaurants or not. Uh, a lot of these things I, I think we need to learn more about. How do you actually get the data? How you assess the data to make the right decisions or the proper decision to make sure that everyone's safe? I know you participated in much of the development of the ERA model that will be um, bit by bit rolled out by the CFIA, the estimating risk as part of um, as part of food safety management. And I, that's that's a webinar topic that we're hoping to get someone from the CFIA to oh, uh, good. discuss yeah. at a future point. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I agree that right now, both within the general public, but also within the scientific community, both organizations have, or both both sectors have challenges with estimating and communicating risk. I, I like the theme of communication too. That I know, I know, um, from my own perspective, uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, Rita Stern encouraged me to read Robert K. Yin's book on case studies <laughs> and that was a that was a really interesting one for me as a, as a as a pure scientist that focused so long on chemistry to understand how to better communicate the science um yeah anyways, and, and as you know Amy we've compared uh, Canada's uh, practices around food safety for decades now uh, comparing Canada with other countries and and Canada typically does very well uh, except for one thing, communications. Uh, we're not we're not very good at it, and I've I, and I've said that to uh, I, I had the pleasure to meet with the president of the CFI recently about a month ago, and met with her executive as well, and um, I, I made it quite clear. I mean, from a from a food from a risk communication perspective, we still have a lot of work to do. Whether it's related to the website, how not user friendly it is. For example, if you want to know how many recalls uh, impact the beef, uh, it would take you a few hours just to extract yes. that information. The other thing coming out of COVID, which I thought was kind of ironic, is that within weeks we were able to develop an app uh, which would allow Canadians to understand whether or not they were exposed to someone else with COVID so they can get tasted, uh, tested and you can track uh, the, the virus as quickly as possible, almost in real time. But we still have, we don't have anything for food recalls. I mean, right now, I remember last summer, we had uh, an onion recall from California. And uh, I in the middle of the summer, and in the middle of summer, rarely you'll cook onions. And I think it was salmonella. And so a lot of people were probably uh, traveling, doing other things and listening to the news. And frankly, because of all the noise created by COVID, and I did say that to the CFI, yes. you can't rely on media to convey risk to people. You have to come up with a way to connect directly 
with consumers so they can protect themselves and take that onion from the fridge out uh, as soon as possible. Same thing for peaches. Uh, the California peaches were impacted by a recall last year. Do you, do you, do you know what happened to peaches uh, sales of peaches in the country? They went down last year because people, when they heard uh, peaches from California, they heard peaches. And yes. guess which province produces a lot of good peaches? Ontario. And, and Niagara in particular. <laughs> exactly. And so sales from our poor farmers in Niagara were impacted by an outbreak outside of our country. So risk communication, if you don't do it right, can cost a lot of money to a lot of people from, from farm gate to plate. Absolutely. Just a, a one quick housekeeping item. We are doing a fireside chat style uh, conversation today. And so we do encourage people in the audience to submit your questions via the GoToWebinar uh, chat box. And one of our moderators, Heidi, will um, make sure that we get that question so that we can um, include you as, as the audience in, in this conversation. Another, another topic that uh, I know has been very, uh, prominent in your mind recently has been Buttergate. And let's just talk uh, <laughs> for a few moments about Buttergate. Uh, yeah. Give a little bit of background of what you are hearing from different consumers in the marketplace. It's uh, it's been it's been an interesting few weeks, a uh, few months uh, rather. I mean, uh, I back in the summer I was starting to hear things about uh, butter not softening at room temperature. Uh, at first, I thought it was a bit of a joke. Uh, I didn't believe it. And uh, soon I actually experienced it myself. We were at the cottage in Quebec, so it was hard. I thought perhaps it was a bad batch in Quebec. Came back home in Halifax, same thing. Uh, we experienced the same thing. And started to talk to different folks in the dairy industry that I, that I trust, uh, farmers, uh, groups, uh, processors, only to realize that uh, perhaps the, the context, COVID may have had something to do with uh, what's what's happening with butter. And of course, we don't know for sure because we haven't evaluated the entire supply chain, but there is a plausible cause, which is, uh, which is uh, palmatic acids uh, given to cows uh, more. And apparently there's, there's more palmatic acids given to dairy cows across the country, and that increases the content of, of saturated fat, which actually makes butter less likely to melt at room temperature or to soften at room temperature. And so again, I can't really demonstrate with beyond reasonable doubt because the one way to do it, it would be to visit all 10,000 dairy farms in the country and see whether or not there's a correlation. But the one thing that we also notice is that if you look at off quota uh, butter, organic or uh, butter made from uh, grass fed uh, cows, they weren't affected by this phenomena at all. You can actually, if you go buy organic butter, it still, it still, it, it still gets soft. So there's there's uh, certainly concerns because now the, the the word is out that the industry is using palm oil to feed cows, which really has been normalized over the years. It's allowed, it's legal, it's not legal. Uh, but you, I, I think a lot of Canadians right now are questioning two things. One, well, is this practice morally acceptable for Canada because we have a strong dairy sector, a very respected dairy sector, to be honest, and, and it is known to provide us with high quality dairy products. Uh, I think Canadians really love Canadian made dairy products, but palm oil in the middle of all that doesn't really, it's almost counterintuitive because there's baggage there with palm oil from the environment, uh, from an environmental perspective, and from a health perspective, that's the second thing that comes up a lot these days in my discussion with some folks is, is, is that food safe? I mean, is it safe to eat? And when you look at the literature right now, there's not a whole lot on this issue at all. I mean, you're, there's some assessment at Farmgate, uh, the level uh, we're seeing a lot of, of, uh, of studies looking at the quality of, of the butter fat leaving the barn, but we don't know if uh, hard butter is 
actually good for us or not. Some people have, asked, have said to me that they, they've seen a change in the color of the butter, they've seen a change in the smell even. I, I haven't seen any any of that, but I certainly have seen a, a change in in texture. So that those are the questions. And at the end of the day, what I'm thinking about is science. Do we need more science to understand these phenomena? Last year, demand for butter went up 13%. And yes. uh, with, with our quota systems, if you're under pressure to produce butter fat and the money's there, uh, butter fat, you need a quick way to increase that, and palm oil is 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 the way to go. I, have you? I'm just curious, Amy. Have you seen a difference in your uh, in the texture of your butter? Do you eat butter? So I do eat butter, and, and to be honest, it was Michael and Anna Olson who reached out to me about Buttergate uh, because uh, obviously um, Michael Olson is a colleague of mine at Niagara College, and I have gotten to know Anna through through Michael, um, and obviously one of Canada's finest baking families. Um, butter, uh, butter for me is, it's two things. I have a table butter and I always get grass fed table butter from, uh, well, I'll, I'll name them. <laughs> I, I yeah. do like the Gailey Thornlow, um, grass fed butter. It's a Canadian product made in Ontario and it's a fantastic table application butter. And then I buy commodity bulk butter, but for my applications, I'm tending to use it in creaming applications and more baked or frying applications. And I don't see the textural attributes as such. I'm not doing lamination, but I, mm. I keep going back to the chemistry on this right now. You're uh, just to, just to outline. Um, so then mentioned the quota system and the dairy farmers are uh, part of how dairy farmers are paid is that the milk goes for raw milk analysis at different centralized labs across the country. And one of yeah. the metrics, in the FTIR system is the fat concentration. And I keep wondering if the FTIR companies like Foss or Perkin Elmer are going to have to create modules, not just for total fat, but fatty acid profiling. And within FTIR systems, that is a possibility. And, and, and hopefully there's a there's a fat chemist out there who focuses on FTIR listening. Um, no, yeah. but no it, it, is a, it is a critical issue. I mean, the dairy sector in Canada is hugely important. We need to make exactly. sure that it is well protected. Uh, the, the concern I have is image. I mean, the, the Blue Cow is, is a well-known brand around the world. Uh, it's a well-known brand, certainly for Canadians. Uh, and right now, today, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw that in the news, Amy, but uh, there are there is a group of Quebec dairy farmers who are going to be presenting a motion at their AGM to uh, either ban the practice or penalize farmers uh, that opt to use palm oil on farms. So you can see that really farmers are, are very concerned about what's going on right now. Feed supplementation does have an important role and 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 at what limitation do you, do you cut back on? Palm oil makes sense in that it's an imported product and we want to maintain that Canadian centered image, but let's say we opted to use, I don't know, canola or soybeans, very high fat canola as, a a feed, as, a, so. <laughs> as a feed supplement. Uh, admittedly, there's going to be fatty acid profile changes, but honestly, um, when, do we, when do we say feed supplementation for the purposes of bulking up that fat quota and, um, and the payout to the farmers, it becomes a limiting factor. Oh, absolutely. I think, and I, I, and think, I think, I mean, this discussion we're having with uh, with butter is, is, I think, an important one. It could lead to a much stronger industry. Um, I'm always disappointed to uh, to to get emails, uh, unpleasant emails. I'll be honest, and I'm sure, Amy, you're not overly surprised because it's upsetting for for a lot of our dairy farmers to hear uh, some of the news out there, but it is it is a, a retailable problem. Consumers are noticing a difference. And so, and they're trying to understand why is this? I mean, a lot of people are baking and they can't bake because the butter is hard. I certainly have destroyed many toasts in the morning <laughs> when I was trying to butter my toast. Uh, so the problem for consumers, beyond the politics, beyond the economics, the problem for Keynes is real. I mean, it's at the dinner table. Brilliant, brilliant. We have a question that has come in from the audience, and it sort of leads to one of our core themes that 
we started with. Um, the question is, what trends in food distribution and online grocery shopping do you see and will continue post-pandemic? And how is this going to change the regional distribution of food? Oh, it's a, it's a good question, a very high-level question. I, I would say right now, um, th there are a couple of questions I get a lot. So are we going to be uh, seeing more people buying online? Well, the industry has committed to invest $12 billion on e-commerce over the next five years. Grocers, $12 billion. So and that's grocers. Oh yeah, and so, so obviously I think they 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 will want us to buy more online, regardless of the pandemic, and they'll get better at it because they'll make more money doing so. And so I I I think this is this is going to last a while, and and the use of technology, the use of data at retail, is going to get better as a result of COVID. I often say, Amy. Uh, Farms have seen way more innovation in the last 30 years than, than food retailing. Because if you go on a farm today, it doesn't look at all what it looked like 30 years ago. Yes. There, there's robotics, there's more automation, salaries have gone way up. I mean, it's much more sophisticated than it used to be. But when you walk into a grocery store, I mean, it looks very similar i mean you, you got the marketing and the design that may have changed but the way grocery stores are managed is very similar so i think covid is just pushing grocers to think about analytics think about data more often think about how they manage people with low wages and that came up a lot like how do we pay people more well the only way to do it is to actually run a more efficient business and so I think that's going to change over time. The other issue, of course, is that we're watching very closely is, is the work from home phenomena. Uh, yeah, you're in Niagara, and uh, I, if, if I were to be in Niagara, I would never move ever, ever again. <laughs> but let's say you're in Toronto. Uh, well, because of COVID, if you can rely on technologies to work from home, why not move to Niagara? Yes, And so you're going to see that shift out. We're already seeing it right now. I mean, the population of Toronto dropped by 50,000 in 12 months, uh, ending on ju in July. So people are actually leaving cities now, same in Montreal, same in Vancouver, just to experience something different. So the, the words that we're hearing right now is flex, you know, flexible uh, working days, three days, at home, two days at home, two days at work, three days at work. The four-day week is uh, is uh, within reach now. I think a lot of people, if they want to work from home, uh, they're saying to themselves, well, a day at home is very efficient compared to a day at work. You know that. You don't have to gossip. Yes. You don't have to you know, do the different things you, you have to do to, to, to deal with the office politics. Um, and so that four day a week phenomena is getting more and more attention as well. And so, and so if you're home, your relationship with food completely changes. And that so, is very true. So restaurants, retail, they're all going to have to adapt at some point. The nine to five workday is dead, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's it, everyone will have a customized sort of formula for themselves and their and their family is, is that something you're you're hearing about uh, amy well in terms of out migration absolutely the out migration to more rural areas is becoming more prevalent and i, I obviously see it in niagara specifically what's interesting though is that the e-commerce uh, grocery solutions that uh, many of these grocers are proposing are very urban centric and living in the rural area that I do, many of the e-commerce platforms are not available to rural Canadians. And it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic to be seen. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm curious about your insight about some of the larger uh, food manufacturers going direct to e-commerce and circumventing the, the, centralized, uh, the centralized distribution through the, the retailers. This is an interesting phenomenon. Um... Kraft Heinz now operates 
three ghost kitchens, two in Toronto and one in Montreal. It's called Restaurant 57. You can actually go yes. on your phone and order a meal made and delivered by Kraft Heinz, a CPG company. Can you imagine? I mean, it's just <laughs> so really the, the entire supply chain is, is much more democratized, much more open. And, and so this blurring line between retail and uh, and and food service no longer exists. I mean, it's just everything's blown. It's been blown up by by COVID, which is really I think exciting because no matter what you're doing in the supply chain, whether you work for a manufacturer, whether you work for a distributor, if you're in if, let's say you're an ingredients, it doesn't matter. Everything is possible now, which is really really fascinating. You got Loblaw selling meal kits coming from restaurants in a GTA. Loblaw went from being a grocer to a food broker. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to see uh, this happening. I never would have thought a year ago that this would be happening. I just keep thinking of the pivots of some other corporations. This, this morning in my email was a, was a, um, a coupon for buying a Saputo box and it, they would ship me by courier a That's box right. of cheese and I was just fascinated thinking should I should I spend the money on a box of cheese Cisco, um, Cisco is selling directly to consumers as well which really as well. Cisco never did uh, any B to C business at all ever but you needed COVID to get them to think about the consumer and 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 companies are, are getting, they're going to get desperate at getting to the consumer to understand us as much as possible. What's going on in our minds? Uh, how are we dealing with the fear related to the virus? How are we dealing with our day-to-day -day stuff? I mean, there's lots, lots of data to capture no matter where you are within the supply chain. Just a, a quick reminder to our friends in the audience, you're very welcome to put a question in the GoToWebinar chat box and we will be glad to address it. I I, uh, I watched the uh, the discussion that you had with Ransom Hawley about the capability of doing wow. rapid analytics and yes. the rise of using different surveying tools to quickly get the feedback of consumers is, is, is a, it's a game changer. Um, I know within my oh. own students, is that your phone or my phone? <laughs> no, it's my phone. Sorry, I, uh, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I'm not pick it up. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, um, the capability of doing uh, rapid analytics has been so drastically changed by the use of social media. Yeah. And curious about your insights there. Well, yeah. So first of all, this is uh, this is a gift that we got from K uh, from Cattle, which is which is great, and uh, we're very happy to partner with with Cattle. It's going to be a great partnership for for us and the university. Um, I mean, the idea behind the concept is to is to is to get data as soon as possible, so we can understand, uh, we can anticipate consumer behavior over time, essentially, so we can actually fuel our machine learning models. Uh, fuel our forecasting models uh, so we can better anticipate. It's it's tough. I mean, really, the one thing that was very tough for grocers to to monitor was how weather affected people going into a grocery store. We we don't really realize it, but if it's raining out, you're just not the same person as if it's sunny out, and you'll buy different things. Let's. The barbecue. Every I can I can bring in a bunch of examples, but COVID has actually amplified that unpredictability aspect of of consumer behavior in stores. So how do you actually anticipate that? And when you think about anticipation or management or managing behavior, think of the money you can save, uh, the food waste generated if you get it wrong. Uh, the people you're actually hiring, doing nothing. Uh, I mean, all of these costs are contributing to inflation eventually. I mean, they have to charge us for all that stuff. And so if you actually run a very efficient, when you think about precision agriculture, that's why I'm, I'm always comparing FarmGate and retail. At FarmGate, I mean, farmers are way ahead. I mean, they're looking at drones, they're looking at uh, at, at testing a bunch of things at retail, we're still trying to figure things out a little bit. And that's what COVID, I think, is going to change over time. 
I keep hearing in your in your messaging data analytics and multivariate analysis. And <laughs> when when I talk to so many students as they get to graduation, they're like, what should I what should I learn next? Consistently data analytics and machine learning and um, mechatronics and robotics are key themes. What what advice do you have to, let's say, a young professional who would be wanting to get into more data analysis? What would you recommend to them to study or where would, what programming would you recommend? Well, Amy, I mean, you're, you're a researcher. I mean, you know, um, I mean, being a Canadian researcher is frustrating. <laughs> Because we don't know, like the CPI report came out today. Uh, StatsCan is telling us that the food inflation rate, the food inflation rate is at one percent right now. Well, is it? I don't believe them. <laughs> really? Like I, I got phone calls this morning. I mean, one percent. I mean, the reality that people are managing while while walking through a grocery store is not one percent. For a couple of reasons. One. Uh, the CPI report rarely captures price volatility, intense price volatility. Uh, so there's that lag, that there's lag in, in the reporting that needs to be appreciated. The other thing is shrinkflation. I mean, Conagra and Kraft Heinz this week, this week, announced that prices are going to go up due to what's going on with commodities. Wheat is up, canola is up, uh, and and more companies are doing that right now to prepare us. But Amy. At the center of the store, prices aren't going to go up. Packages are going to shrink. Yes. They just don't want to spook us. And that's inflation. You're getting less for your money. And I'm not, I've, I was never convinced that StatsCan actually captures that phenomenon quite well. It, and it started, I mean, it started more than two decades ago, but it, it intensified uh, during the last financial crisis in 2008, 2009, when you saw way more packages just shrinking, and it was almost like obvious from one week to, to another. I, you've noticed uh, shrinkflation, Amy, I'm sure. Well, I have a teenager, and chocolate milk is one of those commodities that we have to keep in the house. And it went from a one liter package to a 750 at the same price. And um, I'm, I'm teaching a course in food labeling right now and obviously talking about package size and serving size is one of the core topics and inevitably that capability of adjusting within the what, what is determined as a serving size is, is a natural way for people to hit uh, front of label claims and the ability to make those nutrition adjustments shrink the package yeah. And suddenly your serving size is less and you can make different claims on the nutritional quality of that product as well, besides the fact that you're mitigating cost on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Oh. And so there, there's lots lots uh, going on there that, uh, that frankly, I feel is underreported. And so we have to really take uh, StatsCan's report as a metric uh, and only a metric, not not gospel because uh, there's lots of things at play right now and and when you look at their 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 food basket is it's not reflective of what we're actually buying either uh, and that's why yes. we've uh, in in Canada's food price report in December we actually updated our own food basket and, and guess what happened to food inflation it, it went up and that's why this year we're predicting a much higher uh, level uh, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, they, 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 they came out last week with, uh, with their um, Food Freedom Day. You've heard of that one? Yes. And uh, I actually think it's a neat concept. I mean, it's, it's like uh, tax, free, tax Freedom Day, Food Freedom Day, why not? It, it gets people to think about food affordability. And, and frankly, the CFA is right in stating that we have access to safe, uh, affordable food in Canada. But... February 9th, as a Food Freedom Day, I did talk to the CFA and I, I did say, I think it's it's underestimating the actual cost of food. Our guess is, is that Food Freedom Day is, is, is probably at the end of February, not at the beginning. And so, but the important thing is to talk about it. It's, it's to talk yes. about food security, trends, understanding food. I think really that's the most important thing. So. Good on the Cane Food, uh, Cane uh, Federation of Agriculture to to uh, to do that because it gets people to talk. 
I like that uh, you mentioned the importance of talking about food. You have been one of the uh, most vocal advocates for the Canadian food system through the media. How, how would you encourage young professionals to get their voices out there and communicate more about what they're doing as food scientists or food professionals? Oh, well, it, it, it's just to get out there. Don't be afraid of your opinion. Uh, don't be, because your opinion is is as important as anyone else's. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, and I say that to my own students. Uh, don't be shy. I mean, you're, everyone's a food consumer. Everyone has an opinion and everyone is different. Uh, everyone is different, which is kind of the beauty of what we're seeing right now with the food industry. All of a sudden, and we have, we're, we should be thankful for millenn millennials um, because of millennials. Millennials were the were the first generation telling the food industry, you know what, what you're doing is not good enough anymore, and and that led to a lot of changes and uh, some innovation as well. We're seeing the naturalization of food ingredients. We're seeing uh, more emphasis on local products. There's less uh, chemicals. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought Cheese Whiz was cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and because that's how it was. And, but now, because of, of that effort, I, I think we're, we're in a better place. But millennials were very vocal. They were, very, they were out there. They were on social media telling companies, this is not acceptable. We need more. Look at sustainability. When you look at food safety, when you look at different issues, food fraud, I mean, there are, all of these issues have become quite important as a result of vocalizing our opinions as consumers. And so anyone out there, of course, with COVID, it's a little bit more difficult to do that, to socialize your, your concerns because we're mostly home. But use social media, express your concerns. I mean, going back to the Buddy Gate issue, I, 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 I must say, I mean, I... If you ask me, am I concerned about the use of palm oil in dairy? Of course I am. I mean, I'm concerned about uh, deforestation uh, in, in other parts of the world and how it could impact other populations around the world. And so how could you not be concerned? But other people aren't, so aren't, aren't that concerned and they think that it should continue just because it's, there's, no, there's no risk or they feel there are, there are no risks. So by talking, by sharing, uh, we get to better understand. And so I, I've been wrong before. And, and of course, a lot of people have come to me with some, some advice and some information, which led me to change my mind, which is, which is okay. I think that's the beauty of the, of the scientific and research communities is that we are encouraged to have really strongly founded and, and, and very factually defined, but it, at the same time, scientists understand that everything constantly changes the science that we had 50 years ago or 100 years ago most certainly has changed and that's yeah. because we have dialogue with one another and we challenge one another to think more and to think better and to get a different perspective i i had a conversation with the students yesterday um some of them were saying well I, i'm really excited about food media or i i want to be a product developer and i'm like you know what the access to communication and having a a really big platform is as simple as having a microphone and a camera and almost everyone is walking around with a microphone and camera in their pocket oh yeah um, no absolutely and um, i must say uh and i'm sure it's the same at, at niagara uh, at dal here we we have some fantastic students and, and they're so curious i mean they're, they're smarter than, than, than when I was 20 myself. I mean, when I was 25, I, I barely knew anything about the world. I mean, now today students are, are coming into universities with, with a lot of, of information, a lot of knowledge, which is great. It's a fantastic uh, sight to see. As a, as a prof and in our lab, of course, recruitment is super easy now because we get, we get great talent. Uh, for, for little money, really. I, I realized that uh, getting, uh, getting your voice out there is as simple as that, as that uh, finding your camera. I, I, my, my teenage daughter is very amused that I'm now a YouTuber and have 
uh, <laughs> hundreds of hundreds of followers, only hundreds. I, but I, I think what pe people are necessarily scared of 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 expressing their opinions. I think they're mostly scared about how people will react to their opinions. And uh, like I said, I, I think you sh you shouldn't. Um, like I've expressed my opinions on a variety of issues, and uh, I and I've gotten. Um, Positive reactions, negative reactions. Uh, I mean, so for example, with Buttergate, I'm getting a lot of positive reactions from the Kenyan public, but very bad reactions from the dairy sec well, from dairy boards particularly, which is fine. I mean, boards have uh, are entitled to their own opinions. I mean, they are <laughs> they they do exist and they have a role to play, and uh, and and they're doing their role. They're 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 doing their work very very well. And so debates are super, super important, especially right now. I actually, I just got it. I saw a question uh, on the post there. Is Buttergate a food fraud case? Which I thought was a pretty good question. Uh, what, what do you think, Amy? Is Buttergate a food fraud case? A food case? fraud case, yeah. I mean, so, a lot of Canadians are, are, are put off guard when they when they learn that uh, palm oil is actually used in the industry what do you think it's it i keep thinking back to the beekeeping scenario if a beekeeper were to feed their bees high fructose corn syrup or uh, granulated sugar and that bee eats it and produces honey is that still honey and according to the regulations it is and it is According yeah. to according to the regulations, it's the same with the milk. Um, yeah, I'm, so, I'm I'm glad you saw the questions because my 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 screen has been freezing. Well, there's a lot there's a lot of questions right now, but that 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 one popped up, and I, I, my my response to to that question is uh, so is it is it technically food fraud? No, it isn't because they actually are following the rules. Uh, however, however, um, as a social scientist. I would say that uh, that uh, the moral contract we have in the industry is 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 almost equally as important. And uh, my this is this is what I'm seeing right now. The last few days, is that I think a lot of people uh, are feeling a little bit betrayed uh, because they just didn't know. They they just didn't know, and and that's why. That's why transparency is so important and communications are so important. If you if you surprise a marketplace or consumers, uh, they will feel that you've breached a moral contract, and uh, and that's really what's happening. But is it food fraud? I don't think it's food fraud. It's just it's something that I think the industry will need to to address, no matter what the outcome is. Um, my my guess. My guess coming out of this is that I, we may see one or two provinces uh, decide to move on on palmitic acids. Be, to be honest, Quebec would probably be yes. one I guess mean, because of of the minister what he said and and some groups, uh, some AGMs are going to see uh, motions. But I actually and, and of course in Quebec, I mean dairy is super important. <laughs> so and, and that image is very very important and and they have bit of a problem in their hands but uh, I do see a much stronger a better dairy industry coming out of this. I'm going to jump to Belinda's question. Um, does Sylvain predict any food categories or products that are declining in demand and may not survive the pandemic? May not survive the pandemic. Well Right now, it's a bit hard to tell because of what happened to food service. So we have Nielsen IQ data. I can tell you that, you know, meat 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 sales went up eight percent in 2020. Is that good? Well, of course, because people actually uh, went to the restaurant less often. So we were expecting a robust year. Seafood is up 14 percent. But when you look at specific specialty products, bison meat is up 197%, rabbit 54%. And so there's lots of activity. Proteins, plant-based, 31%, both dairy and, uh, and uh, the process, the Beyond Meat products all together is 31%. So you can see that 
consumers are looking everywhere. It's it's hard to tell if there is one shrinking category. I would say that one thing for sure is that you should expect more private labels <laughs> because you increase margins. There'll be there'll be less. Um, uh, the number of options for a consumer will will drop just because uh, the number of SKUs will will be reduced. It just costs too much money to manage 20,000 SKUs in a, in a store. And so I do expect that to happen much more so. But when it comes to, um, to categories disappearing or uh, shrinking, it's, it's too early to tell. The, sea, the fish and seafood uh, portion of the grocery store has always been a concern for me. Uh, we looked at the numbers for last year. They were actually up uh, 12% in volume. I'm, I'm talking about volume, you're not, not dollars, because dollars is way more because of inflation. But in volume, it's actually uh, pretty decent. But I don't know if it's going to last, because seafood is pretty expensive. And, and, they, and during when, when people are experiencing an economic downturn, as you know, Amy, people trade down. So, yes. There was a question that came in, how, how is the dynamic for buying local food products going to shift because of the, because of the pandemic and the, the work from home programs? Yeah, we actually did, a, we released a report on, on this issue just a few months ago, uh, which, I, which I thought was interesting because uh, I think everyone knows that everyone wants to buy local. <laughs> I mean, buying local is is motherhood and apple pie. Who doesn't? Who's against local? I mean, seriously, uh, I don't know anybody who's against local. Um, but what we found out in our research is that people aren't necessarily hardwired to look for local products once they are in the grocery store. Because once they are in a grocery store, uh, life takes over. You, you got kids, time, uh, you can only spend 15, 20 minutes in the grocery store, uh, you got stuff to do, uh, and of course you, you'll look at price, and if that product happens to be from Ontario or wherever you are, that's great. But only 25% of the population will proactively look for local products, 25. The rest, it's random. So like I said, People want local, they're even willing to pay more for local, but people aren't hardwired to look for local. So what I'm advising governments and, and different folks is to, I mean, marketing is a big one. I mean, you get people to think about local, to talk about local, and, and once you do that, it's great. The other challenge with local is what does local mean? Yes. <laughs> and we have different definitions of what local is and, and what is in some cases, uh, Amy? <laughs> what is the definitions? I have a presentation, I'll send it. But uh, depending <laughs> on which jurisdiction you're in, your definition is going to change. And if you are, let's say you are a local producer on the borderline of a province, um, uh, the maritime province is being a particularly notorious um, if you're on a on the border of one province but want to sell in a farmer's market in another province, you may not be a local product anymore because you've uh, crossed a provincial barrier. And the, uh, some of these definitions, I know that there's some initiatives with CFIA to modernize the made in Canada and local definitions, but um, there are also trade implications here based off of some of the trade participation that we're in. And I haven't, I haven't taken the time to review um, the new USMCA's implications on what we, what we can do in terms of um, some of these uh, country of origin labeling requirements. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so this is, this is, this is, a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Uh, when I was in Ontario, of course, uh, I saw Foodland Ontario uh, really promoting uh, food products quite well. I mean, Foodland Ontario is a success story, I, I think. But the one thing Foodland Ontario has never done is to recognize regionalities. Uh, someone in Durham may not, and based on our data uh, coming out of Ontario as an example, uh, if you're in Durham, you're not necessarily going to consider products from Peel as local for example, or Niagara. And so, so 
I think there's some sensitivities that would need to be uh, articulated in in some of these campaigns over time. And, and there are three provinces where regionalities are pretty key. It's Quebec, Ontario, and BC. Uh, in in Nova Scotia, where I am here, a a great Ontario peach would be considered local. That's yes. that's basically because if it's in Canada, if it's grown in Canada, it's local. But not but it does it's not it doesn't work the same way in in Quebec or Ontario. I'm watching the time here, and I have I have a. Uh, a whole slew of questions coming I in. Know, rapid I, 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 I know. I know. Um, I'm going to take one last question from the audience, and then I have one one more question for myself. Um, you, uh, we were talking about the dynamics of the labor market, and, and, and particularly for farmers, increasing their revenues. We're seeing increased revenues for food manufacturing as well, with this um, shift away from food service. But meanwhile, we're not seeing necessarily changes to the baseline labor salaries being provided. The question that came in was related to temporary foreign workers, but we're also seeing this within the labor market that there's massive labor shortages for the baseline workers within food manufacturing. Are there any initiatives that are, you have seen uh, that are going to be addressing these labor shortages and how do we encourage young people into these types of careers? Oh boy. <laughs> That's my answer too. <laughs> I, I have a very realistic view on this issue. I actually think that temporary foreign workers have a role to play. Uh, I, I just think it's been underappreciated, uh, as, uh, especially in, in Ontario. I think, um, I mean, they were, it was a challenging year in 2020. Uh, there were, you know, a lot of problems on farms with COVID deaths. I mean, it was just horrible, just horrible. And uh, and of course, it really didn't help our image uh, internationally. When foreign workers come here and die, that's just not good at all. And uh, and I think there's some work to be done there. I I you know, young Canadians. Uh, have been urbanized. I mean, it's it's just, I, I worked on farms when I was a kid. Uh, I would never do that again. It's a lot of work. Uh, as soon as, as the sun goes up to the sun goes down, then it has, you have to do it all over again the next morning, rain or shine. It, it's just tough work. And, uh, and, and young Canadians aren't necessarily lazy. It's just, they're not necessarily hardwired to do that kind of work they do other types of work it's just that's how it is i think there there is a minority of people who will want to make a difference who will want to to do something which is why we're seeing a, a small increase in the number of small hobby farms in canada which is great i mean it's awesome to see more people engage in agriculture and what and and the fact that we're seeing more people leaving cities, I think it's going to contribute to that phenomena. But I, I'm not expecting miracles. I do expect Canada to to hire a steady 60, uh, 70,000 uh, foreign workers every year to support our farmers. And frankly, these people are well trained. They're professionals. Their work ethics is unbelievable. And most of them are almost family. Actually, I, I'm going to yeah. rephrase that. Most most of these foreign workers are considered family for farmers. So it's just, I, I would say, I, I would I would certainly encourage uh, a blend of both, I guess. My last question is about Putin. Uh, we are all waiting <laughs> in great anticipation for your book. Tell us a little bit about uh, the book that's coming up. Yeah, Poutine Nation. I mean, it's uh, it's coming out on, on April 21st. Uh, it's uh, it was supposed to be released last year. It's it it feels uh, like a long time because I actually wrote the book in 2019. What's fascinating <laughs> about the book is that I was asked by my editor to reread it over Christmas, and I barely had to make any changes as a result of COVID. So I guess it's timeless. I don't know, but. The whole idea started when, so Poutine comes from my own region, by the way. I'm from originally from Farnham, Quebec, and Poutine was invented in my region. And I won't tell you where exactly, there's a bit of debate about 
where it was actually created in the first place. So I go through the history of poutine, when it was created, why it was created, by whom, what was the context. Uh, poutine was created, was invented in 1957. And I actually make a parallel between the evolution of poutine and how it, it became a globalized dish with uh, pizza coming out of Napoli, Italy. And so I look at both dishes, how they, beca they became globalized. Uh, all, all two of them had three ingredients and were seen as you know, dishes for the poor, uh, both of them. Uh, and things changed over time. Uh, poutine is, exists, is in existence for about 60, 70 years now. It's still a young dish, but it's been amazing. In the book, so I go do, I do that, and I also um, travel around the world when traveling was allowed, and I actually tasted poutine in uh, Cleveland, New Orleans, Toronto, obviously Vancouver, Paris, Singapore, uh, Shanghai, and Brisbane, Australia. And every time, I did not have a problem finding poutine. <laughs> and yeah. where is the best? Where's the? I'll leave it with that. And last question: Where's the best poutine? Uh, well, anything outside Quebec is uh, is questionable quality. I, I must <laughs> admit. But in Quebec, the the other thing that I talk about the book is that your first poutine will mark you for life. And so my favorite poutine is is my is is the poutine I ate um, when I was eight years old, nine years old, I think, in my hometown of Farnham. And, and the place still exists. And I actually went to interview the person who now owns that place and, and had a poutine with him uh, when I was writing the book. So it was great. I, I, and I didn't <laughs> gain any pounds, by the way. So there you go. <laughs> Dernière question, sauce Saint-Hubert sur le poutine, ou non? Ah, it's okay, you know. It's, uh... <laughs> That's what we ate a lot of in university. My roommates uh, really liked that. So then yeah, on behalf of this... Cheese, uh... right? so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology and Food in Canada magazine, we are so grateful for your generosity, sharing time and taking time to answer questions from the audience. For those of you who ask questions, we will um, run them through an email and see if we can raise them back uh, through one of our newsletters. Um, just a quick reminder, we are hosting webinars every second Wednesday until June and through September and no, uh, to November again. Next week, we or not next week, two weeks from now, pardon me, on March 3rd, we will have John JQ, who is um, an expert in blockchain technology and traceability systems. And he will be speaking on food ecosystems, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And again, I just want to thank Sylvain so much for uh, generously way, sharing time. Hey, John is an affiliate of our lab. He's a great guy, great, great guest. Excellent. And I know he is also very big on data analytics and that trending conversation about um, big data as part of the food system. Honestly, I don't think that's going to disappear as one of the core themes that we have in our webinar series. So again, thank you so much for your generous um, your generous uh, sharing of time and information with us. And thank you to all of you who have attended. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you at the next seminar series.